Mancha. Good morning, participants. Welcome to pedagogy training. My name is Professor Francis Indoshi. I'm the chairman of the Department of Educational Communication, Technology and Curriculum Studies at Masena University. I'm accompanied by my colleagues from the department, Dr. Joseph Rabari, uh, Mr. Isaac Mugaka, and Dr. Josh Kowino. The topic of our presentation is constructive alignment of learning outcomes, learning activities, and assessment of learning outcomes in the development of e-learning modules. Our presentation is going to be in four parts. There will be concept of constructive alignment, which I'll deal with. Then there will be development of learning outcomes, which Dr. Rabari will deal with. There will be development of learning activities, which Mr. Mogaka will deal with. And then there will finally be assessment of learning outcomes, which Dr. Joash Kowino will deal with. So I begin on the first part of the presentation, which is constructive alignment. This is a new concept in pedagogy, which is very important in ensuring that learning takes place as intended. But by the end of this session, I will expect you to explain this concept and also to apply the concept the concept of a constructive alignment in content development. The concept of constructive alignment is embedded in the outcome-based curriculum, which means starting with a clear picture of what, what is important for students to be able to do, then organizing the curriculum, instruction and assessment to make sure that this learning ultimately takes place. A good example in the Kenyan context is the curriculum, the competence-based curriculum, which borrows a lot from this idea. And the purpose of emphasizing this theory or approach is to move education process from mere acquisition of knowledge to acquisition of competencies or learning outcomes that are applicable in the real world. The concept of constructive alignment is based on the work of John Biggs, 2003. He calls the model constructive alignment, which he defines as coherence between assessment, teaching strategies, and intended learning outcomes in an educational program. The term constructive is used because the model is based on the psychology of constructivism, which is the idea that knowledge is constructed through the activities of the learner. It is not what the teacher does that results in the learning. It is what the student does. So the work of the, student, of the teacher is to facilitate the environment for students to engage in the appropriate activities and develop meaning. The term alignment is used because both teaching and assessment need to be aligned to the intended learning outcomes. Now, in this model, we have three components that are important in the curriculum design. The first one is learning outcome, which describes the students to the students what they should perform after undergoing the learning process. For example, apply procedures, compare theories. The second element is learning activities, which refers to the experiences that students undertake to meet the learning outcome. And the third one is assessment, 
which is a measure of how well students have learned from the activities to achieve intended learning outcomes. Any academic program, according to the Q standards, should facilitate a balance. So right now, the only problem you know. Michael, please mute your microphone. Any academic program, as per the Q standard or programs, is to facilitate a balance a balanced learning process, ensuring that students are able to acquire cognitive, affective, and psychomotor skills. In the cognitive domain, we'll be dealing with outcomes which involve intellectual tasks. In the psychomotor domain, we'll be dealing with learning outcomes which develop motor skills, such as performing operation on patients or repair of motor vehicles. And this, of course, is assessed through practical examinations. The affective domain will be dealing with the learning outcomes which deal with feelings, attitudes, interests, and values. So, when you are using the constructive aligning mo alignment model, the procedure is as follows. One, describe the intended learning outcomes using appropriate action verbs. Create, the second one is create a learning environment using teaching and learning activities that require students to engage each verb. Thirdly, use assessment tasks that contain that verb, therefore enabling one to judge whether learning has taken place. For example, if the intended learning outcome is to develop writing skills, then the activities that you develop will re revolve around writing, and the assessment will involve writing an essay instead of a multiple choice exam. The action verb in the learning outcome is the common link that establishes alignment between the learning outcomes, the learning activities, and the assessment of learning outcomes. So the idea of alignment is to ensure that uh, there is coherence in the program. An example of a constructive alignment in a curriculum, for example, if the module is on evaluation and reflect, evaluating and reflecting on your teaching, and the learning outcome is the students should be able to use a range of methods to gather student feedback. The learning activities might involve methods of gathering student feedback, or a project on collecting student feedback using a variety of methods. And the assessment will involve evidence of having received and responded to student feedback, or a reflection of a reflective statement of what has been achieved as a result of gathering feedback from students. It is important to ensure that while we are trying to align these three elements, we provide for feedback to the students at every stage. And this is important because it impacts on student learning and it needs to be based and consistent with the learning outcomes. When we provide the learning opportunities, we may have to incorporate formative assessment, commonly known as continuous assessment, to ensure that we monitor the extent of the alignment of the existing three elements. Now, I would like to turn to the application of the constructive alignment in content development. To apply this concept, use a table or a spreadsheet to visualize 
the alignment within a subject. You choose a, you take a topic and start with the subject learning outcomes. Identify the learning experiences. And then finally, identify the assessment that will meet the learning outcomes. Example, if the learning outcomes you intend to have are, for example, the students will be able to, one, explain how constructive alignment enhances student learning. Two, design a subject using the principles of constructive alignment. The learning experiences or activities that you should plan in the module might involve reading information, analyzing subject learning outcomes, referring to taxonomy tables, and so on. And the assessment that you will develop for this activity is the students examine and analyze subject learning outcomes and develop aligned assessment tasks or develop teaching and learning experiences. What are the advantages of using constructive alignment in content development? We will be more effective in evaluation of modules and courses. There will be greater standardization leading to fairer and more reliable assessment. There will also be greater transparency in teaching and learning process. There will be greater co coherence in program learning and it will also ensure that practical learner engagement in the teaching learning process. When we align these three elements, it is very difficult for a learner to escape without learning. As I come to the end of my part of presentation, the, there is a session evaluation, and I would like you to choose a topic in any of your teaching courses and develop the content by aligning learning outcomes, learning activities, and assessment of learning outcomes. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. At this stage, I would like to invite Dr. Joseph Rabari to give us highlights on how to develop learning outcomes when developing e-learning models. Okay, good morning once more, dear participants. Our next session, as you've been told, is about uh, learning outcomes. Um, as you are all aware, um, any serious undertaking. Any serious undertaking uh, requires planning. And planning requires that you have a target in mind, what you want to achieve by the end of that session. And this applies to anything that we do in life. So this session is not an exception. The, we have what we, therefore we call session learning outcomes, which are the targets for this session. And our learning uh, session outcomes are, by the end of this session, you as participants should be able to explain, one, explain the meaning of learning outcome, and two, construct appropriate learning outcomes. And because this session is about learning outcomes, I want us to begin by defining learning outcomes. You're with me, you're on the slide. Uh, look at the past bullet, that is the definition. It's a statement specifying what learners or students should be able to do with the knowledge and skills acquired by the end of the class. That may be, for example, a lecture or a course or by the end of a program. Our examples may be to perform a surgery, maybe to set up a micro enterprise, in business studies, and so on. Learning outcomes of certain very important characteristics, like in uh, number one, they focus on the context and potential applications of knowledge 
and skills instead of coverage of material. Although material or content is covered, it is not the main emphasis. The emphasis is what with the learner will be able to do after learning that content or material. And good uh, learning objective, learning outcomes emphasize integration of knowledge and it is contextual. For example, in the area discipline of medicine, uh, it's relevant. It must be contextual. For example, uh, dealing with, uh, you expect the learner to be able to be competently manage tropical diseases, for example, which may not apply in other parts of the world. So the outcome you target must relate to the immediate environment of the learner. Another example is employment. And employment is a serious uh, issue, and therefore, uh, it could, an objective or a learning outcome could be uh, constructed around that area. Now, there are usually terms that uh, also refer to targets. Things like goals, objectives, purpose. They are also used and you will meet them. And uh, you may need to know what the difference is between those and what we are calling learning outcomes because they are all targets even learning outcomes are all are targets now the difference is this a goal is a broad statement of intent or target to be achieved by the end of a program of study like if you talk of goals of education in kenya national goals of education that's a very broad and there are eight if you have looked at them it's a very broad target example is the goal of a curriculum phd in curriculum studies program is to produce graduates with competence in the development of training programs, policy analysis, and research in the field of curriculum. You can see how broad that is. Now, a purpose is also broad. It's broad, but not as broad as the uh, goal. It is derived actually from a goal. And uh, usually, in our case, like what the template that CUE has given us, it applies to course, courses. While goals apply to programs, uh, purpose applies to courses. An example, uh, this course is intended to equip learners with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to apply quantitative and qualitative techniques and procedures in educational research. And you need to note that the um, main difference is while the goal and purpose are statements that communicate what the program or the lecturer intends to achieve. Learning or outcomes, on the other hand, target what the learner should be able to do. And that's a very important difference. There is another silent difference, and which is also equally important. And that is uh, learning outcomes have the connotation of commitment. So when you talk of learning outcomes, you are committed to achieving it. So you must assess at each stage of the teaching or learning process, you assess to ensure you are on course and the objectives and the learning outcomes are being achieved. I compare it with the use of shall and will. I will, I shall. So I will, I'm committing myself. And so uh, learning outcomes actually commit our efforts to achieving uh, the intended then the purposes. Why do we need learning outcomes? There are many reasons why we use learning outcomes. First of all, uh, they serve as links between the broad goals, the broad purpose, and what is uh, practically implemented in the teaching learning, learning situation. So it is a breaking down of goals and objectives in, into what can be directly implemented or taught. And because of this, uh, we are also saying that uh, it's help us set, set targets and set performance standards. And it is the basis of assessment. Remember, if you didn't have a goal, you didn't have um, I mean, a learning outcomes uh, that you target, then at the end, it may be very difficult even to assess because you assess with uh, the aim of establishing whether what you set has been achieved. Yes, the other important uh, 
there are many purposes, I mean, uh, purposes of say, but I need mean, to take note of the motivation of learning. When uh, you provide learning uh, outcomes, if you make it clear to the learner, then they become focused because they know what they stand to achieve if they remain committed to the course. So it motivates the learning process. And it also directs their reading. We encourage learners to do a lot of work on their own. And that may be difficult if they don't know what is expected of them by the end of that course. And that's a very important reason for a learning outcome. How to construct learning outcomes. There is a procedure very important that you need to follow when constructing learning outcomes. The first step that you need to, con to do uh, to ensure is to consider program goal. I said goal is the, the overall. So you consider the goal. Uh, or, and then consider also the purpose of, of a course. Then translate the goals or purpose into more specific short-term targets that can be achieved within a lecture session, a course, or a program. What I refer to earlier as breaking down the, the program or goal into manageable implementable units. Uh, learning outcomes uh, usually have very important, four important components. And that is time, audience, okay, the person targeted with the learning outcome, the targeted behavior, and the standard of measurement, uh, standard of, um, of performance. Uh, and it normally reads in this manner. By the end of maybe this course, now that, that by doing that, we have specified the time. The you, the audience, the audience is you or the learner should be able to, okay? Then the behavior, the behavior may be to, to manipulate or to construct or to design or to explain something, okay? So behavior is expressed in terms of an action verb as you have been uh, told by a professor and it includes the object of action. For example, uh, to write a concise report of a diagnosis or to determine the value correct to plus or minus 0 0.1 microamperes, for example, in physics. The word concise there uh, uh, reflects the standard of performance. Okay, it should be precise. So those four components are very important. When we are. But in addition, we need to consider what we call Bloom's taxonomy uh, when selecting appropriate bars. Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. Now, Bloom uh, came up with um, uh, a classification of knowledge. He classified knowledge into six levels, beginning with the, the easiest or the lowest to the highest. And um, according to him, recall, okay, we all agree that actually the lowest level of knowledge is being asked to name something or being asked to state something, being asked to define or being asked to just remember. So th that such activities just require record, and that is the lowest level of knowledge. So it calls uh, level, level one, the recall. And recall has to do with remembering, recalling information, recognizing, listing, describing, retrieving, and so on. If you look at that table, uh, the second column of it. Then the second one is understanding or comprehension. And you can also see the words that go with it, that level. The application using information in another familiar situation, and so on. The words that refer to it, next. Four, five, six, and so on. So number four, analysis, that is exploring the structure of, a, for example, story, exploring the structure of a cell, of nucleus, or uh, an, an analyzing literature, or, or literary text and so on. Evaluation has to do with making decision or uh, making a, a decision, collecting information, analyzing with the purpose of making a decision, making value judgment, uh, weighing options to decide the best option to adopt, and so on. Creativity is considered the last, the, I mean the highest level. Uh, 
on Bloom's taxonomy, and it involves coming up with the new things, creating new things, novelties, uh, innovations, discoveries, new products, like uh, designing new uh, antivirus or new vaccine, as is the case at the moment, uh, designing new equipment, and so on. Now, what we need to note again, there are so many levels, one to six, but learning outcomes uh, emphasize application, and therefore we should uh, employ more of the last three levels. Most of our learning outcomes should be based on the last three levels. Examples. Uh, here we have the program example of a goal. I've already given you one earlier, but I just want us to see how it relates. The arrow here means now, now learning outcomes are derived from the goal. And specific learning outcomes here are by the end of the program, the learner should be able to design, blah, blah, develop, and so on, train personnel, etc., et manage and advise, and so on, apply advanced methods, and so on. What I would like us to observe uh, or take note of is that uh, the, the program of the broadness of the scope, all of the scope of the goal. Okay, and then how pitched, the high pitched learning outcome by way of the actual verbs we have used, design, train, etc. The high pitched learning objectives. Uh, and that is expected because this is a PhD program. Uh, so, and then the four learning outcomes collectively meet the goal. Okay. Uh, but again, they are also broad because they are at the at the program level, learning outcomes are at the program level. So they are, this, this should have been, this should have been. Yes. So further examples, uh, you, uh, we will give you some further examples in your um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, but the further, the next example now gives us the example of a course, a purpose, of a course and the learning outcomes of a course. Again, the verbs you use, take note of the verbs you use, the critique, learners should be able to critique, to select, to generate, to write, to apply, and so on. Okay, next. The next example is about a, a specific, an undergraduate course. The previous ones were about PhD, but this is now undergraduate, and I want you to see again. Still, we are emphasizing the use of high, I mean, uh, uh, the, the upper three levels on the Bloom's taxonomy. So, next. I've got, we have gone down also to give you some examples of a topic, even a topic you are teaching or lecturing should have uh, learning outcomes. And I've provided there some sub subtopics within a topic called resources for teaching physics. And you can see the learning outcomes designed to achieve those uh, uh, the purposes. Yeah. So those are topic level uh, of deep learning objectives. All absolute bouts again are high pitch. But now the question is, suppose we are emphasizing high pitched from undergraduate to, to PhD, what then would be the difference? Now, we are limited. The words we can only use, we don't have, we cannot create more words than those which exist. But it's possible to still uh, increase the level, increase the level, because you can now skew, as you move towards from undergraduate to PhD, you now skew them more and more towards towards creation, towards creativity. Okay, more and more towards the last two levels. Okay, and also note that the meaning of these action verbs depend on context. Okay, and the the nature of the material you are teaching, the content you are teaching, will also determine the level. Okay, like when we are saying. Uh, in physics, for example, 
you to explain the the working of uh, uh, a tamogan, for example. That is different from explaining, for example, the theory of relativity. The word is explaining, but the content the contents are different. So that makes them also different. The affective domain. Now you notice, yeah, the, the taxonomy of Bloom you have just dis described is about cognition, it's about knowledge. But you all realize that knowledge is not enough. There is much more that we, we need to, to have. You may know something, but you can't use it. Okay, maybe because you are not interested in using it. And therefore, that takes us to the taxonomy called the affective domain taxonomy and um, this cater for uh, special courses that address professional conduct or ethics okay uh, they also uh, they are also designed uh, they are also catered for through the design of learning activities which uh, you will be get taken through after this okay like the cooperative learning Okay, cooperative learning, uh, having learners work together, maybe discuss issues together. By that act of act um, act of discussing things together, they learn to appreciate one another. They learn to listen to one another. They learn to love one another, which you cannot get from the concepts. Okay, so that is the way in which um, the effective domains can be achieved. And if you look at it, the lowest level is receiving. Okay. And receiving, uh, a, one of the ways of receiving is listening and listening to a colleague talking or contributing uh, to the discussion. Even with the cognition plus affective domain, still we would be inadequate because we would be lacking the psychomotor skills. The act of doing, using the limbs or hands to make something, maybe to do experiments, to design and to construct something. Again, of course, you are using knowledge, but it's another skill here you need, which you call psychomotor skills. And uh, these are best learned through practice. Okay, so psychomotor skills refer to use of hands, parts of the body, to accomplish tasks or manipulative skills. They are critical physical activity in physical activities such as constructing models, carrying out experiments with precision, performing medical operation, etc. Okay, and for this, now what we are calling the psychomotor. Okay, so as a way of evaluating this course, uh, can you uh, try to construct or formulate uh, appropriate learning outcomes for each of the upper three levels of Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy? Thank you. Okay, and now I'm going to invite my colleague. Uh, Mr. Mugaka to do a presentation on uh, learning activities. Very good. Mr. Mugaka.
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Abari. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rabari. Uh, my part is on uh, the learning activities, and by the end of the session, the participants should be able to explain what is a learning activity and they construct a variety of learning activities from uh, topics uh, in your course. In this presentation, I intend to look at a theoretical background of learning activities. Then uh, I will uh, define what's a learning activity, look at the need for learning activities, uh, give a guideline for constructing and selecting learning activities, and uh, finally, uh, examples of learning activities. Uh, I start on the theoretical background of learning activities. The first presenter dwelt much on the theoretical background and he focused on constructivism. And the constructivism is the most current theory for instructional design and learning. And the main idea about constructivism is uh, everything is focused on the learner. The learner is willing to explore his or her environment. The role of the instructor, the, ro uh, the role of the teacher is to facilitate, to ensure that the instructional environment is available for the learner to explore, to learn more. And you will appreciate right from the beginning, we are not talking about teaching activities. Teaching and learning, there are two uh, sides of the same coin. The focus is on learning. Once learning has taken place, it is when we can also talk of what teaching has taken place. But most of the teacher's activities are uh, implicit. What is so clear, what is so open, is what we focus on what the learner does. Now, if I go to, straight away to theoretical background of learning activities, the first thing is uh, free learning preparations. This is where we have to ensure that the prerequisites, the background knowledge, what the learners come uh, with in the lecture, in the course, has it been captured? Has it been incorporated in the course? A student doing medicine, uh, uh, does this person have the prerequisite knowledge to participate or to pursue the course? It is done in most cases by pre-testing, but in our case, we normally see if a, a student has taught a, a grade A and so on, we assume that this student has covered the essentials that uh, need this person to prepare for the course. The other thing we look at is the learning outcome, and uh, my immediate uh, presenters really talked uh, much about the, the learning outcomes. But uh, let the learning outcome be stated clearly for every topic and every unit. And what is important, we should always inform the learners what are the expected learning outcomes. It is not for the teacher's uh, consumption or the lecturers. It is for the learner. Most uh, presenters, most lecturers, most teachers assume and they don't really explain the learning outcomes. They are clearly written, systematically done, and then the learners are formed accordingly. 
The other thing is the organization of the content. Uh, theorists have come, uh, Bloom, Robert Gunn, Bruna, they say once the content is well organized, in a logical way from the simplest to the most difficult, what we call hierarchies of learning, so that it, there is a, a smooth progression. You are a group of uh, people that uh, do a lot of systems, circulation system, respiratory system, teaching, learning as components, their systems or subsystems. So yeah, unless these uh, systems work coherently, and this was really emphasized by the first presenter that uh, content organization must be coherent, must work for the, uh, the common good. So the other component is uh, as we have to look at the individual differences. Even if we have uh, students who have a class of 44 or 46, still we will find that uh, when you actually teach them, you will find that their rate of understanding, their rate of participation is quite different. So this is why we say we have to be aware that learners at, uh, learn at various rates and in different ways. So this is why in our preparation, in our involvement of the learners, we have to consider their individual differences. Motivation is very important. We may have a class of uh, uh, students. If we don't really stimulate, we don't expose them to a variety of experiences, then the learning becomes meaningless. Instructions are developed in such a manner as to be both important and interesting, meaningful to the learner. So, as I said, uh, the objective, the learning outcome must be explained right from the beginning. The learner should uh, be aware what is expected of him. Acknowledgement of success in learning is provided to encourage further learning. You know, the most important thing is uh, how we involve, how do we uh, make the learner interested in the learning process, whether you are there or not. The other component we have to look at, and again, with your area, you need supporting materials for your work you are doing. The instructional resources, you are doing a practical, you some practicals, they are not possible in our labs. You need a video, you need a simulation. And this is why we say that even those videos, uh, they must be carefully selected and systematically integrated to support activities in your teaching learning situation. It should be flexible and they should also increase opportunity for adaption to the individual needs. One of uh, the techniques that constructivism emphasizes is participation. The learner has to construct his or her own knowledge, depending on the experience. So participation requires the, the learner to write, answer, solve uh, problems, engage in many instructional activities. Participation may also take the form of physical activity or a performance. As it is the case, as I've said, your area involves a lot of practicals. The learner must have what we call hands-on, participatory learning. The learner has to do so that uh, that experience is gained. Feedback is also very important. And we say feedback is emotive. There are cases even when we give instructions, the learners, not all of them, get the idea or the procedures to follow in an experiment in a lab and so on. So we have to tell them you've tried, but you have uh, missed one or two points. Feedback takes place by providing correct answers against which learners can check their responses. 
Constructive criticism is <laughs> important uh, and the informal discussions is part of uh, uh, the evaluation or reflecting on what we have uh, done. Reinforcement is also by receiving uh, information. When the learners receive information, the tutor, the lecturer is concerned these people keep on learning. They are motivated to keep on uh, doing the work. Let me go to the second part of uh, what is a, a learning activity. And uh, a learning activity is designed or developed by the instructor or the teacher uh, to bring about or create variable conditions for learning. So the immediate presenter talked about Bloom's taxonomy. These activities you are engaging the learner. How have you organized them? Right from the simplest to the most difficult. Do you have uh, in your presentation one hour lecture, two hours, three hours? Do you have a variety of activities? What you engage the learner so that the meaningful learning takes place. So these are activities designed or developed by the instructor to bring about uh, or create favorable conditions for learning. In fact, another one for uh, instruction is actually creation of knowledge. So the teacher has to engage the learners to achieve the learning outcomes. The learning outcomes are broad, but it's out of the learning outcomes that we come to break down to the learning activities. What you anticipate the learner to do and achieve at the end of the session, at the end of one hour lecture, at the end of uh, three hour lecture and so on. What is the need for learning activities? We need to stimulate experience. Hands-on activities are very important. And your area is, uh, your area of provision is very important that uh, experience through experiments, through other activities is very important. Let us stimulate uh, the exp experiential learning. We have also to encourage conceptual uh, thinking. Uh, sciences, technology, and others, many subjects, they deal with concepts. And once the learner is given favorable condition, uh, right from the basics to come up with a concept is very important. Let us help these uh, learners to form a concept. The other purpose is to prompt learners to engage in uh, the learning. They are active, they are not passive, and this is why uh, we need the learning activities. We also need them to interact. There are what we call the interactive events in a, a presentation or in a, a learning environment. The learner can interact with the media, the learner can interact with the colleagues, the learner can inter interact with the facilitator. We have to make sure that we exhaust all those interactive activities. It is also a, a good guideline uh, for selecting. We need to select and uh, arrange them in a hierarchy call or in a, uh, a logical sequence. We also need to establish the background and the prerequisites of the learners. We also have to, what we call the prerequisite level of the learners, the age, the motivational level, and so on. The topic, even when we are uh, doing the same course, same program, we may find that topics, the level of complexity is not the same for all the topics. So let us uh, analyze 
And this is why we talk about uh, context uh, analysis. We see how difficult is the content and how do we cater for the individual differences? Because currently we are talking about we have to take care of uh, uh, all the learners who are participating. Guidelines, guidelines for selecting uh, and constructing learning activities. As I've said, we can, we heavily rely on the learning outcomes. And this is why we say instructional design is a system. We, we talk about content, we talk about uh, the learner, we talk about uh, the learning outcomes, we talk about uh, goals. All this have, must come together. So one of the things we have to look at is the learning outcomes. And we have commented the background or the prerequisite of the learners. Uh, we have talked about that. The other, sorry, we go to examples of learning activities. Here we need uh, the learner to observe maybe a video. There are some practicals. For sure, you have examples in your subject area. You cannot bring the really things in the lab. You need maybe a video. You need a simulation from somewhere so that the learners can be guided and see the main things. Uh, brainstorming is one of the most important where maybe you come up with a, a crucial, a controversial topic and you won't see how the participants are reacting. There are cases where you cannot give all the lecture notes. You also have to link the learners with some materials so that they read. Writing is also very important after reading you need them to do something to summarize the work they have done or a follow through uh, in a form of, of uh, assignment. Discussion in constructivism, cooperative learning is very important. Where learners share ideas, they exchange uh, ideas, and it has very many advantages because the learner has to respect the views of the others. There are learners who are unable or who shy away speaking in a big group. But when you put them in a group of two, a group of three, uh, they are very creative. That's when you realize that these guys have a lot of ideas. And that's why the constructivism theory is saying cooperative, encourage. And when you have an activity, ensure that each member has a role to play. Uh, there is a, a share person, there is a recorder. If, if there are five members, there, there are ten, ensure that each member has a, a role to play. Uh, you can also give them a, a topic to do the research on their own. Role play is, uh, is related to uh, stimulation, but it can also be done in uh, a classroom situation experimenting this is uh, what uh, we expect the physical sciences uh, schools of medicine and all the others to do a lot of experiments so that the learners are able to experience they are able to participate in the real situation in uh, as a follow through i'll ask you to construct learning activities from eno any topic of your course and uh, arrange them uh, in a logical order from the simplest to the, um, uh, to the most difficult. Construct appropriate learning activities from any, of, uh, from any topic of your course or your program. Thank you very much. Uh, I take this opportunity to, to, divide, uh, to invite uh, Dr. Kowino uh, to take us through in the evaluation uh, component. Welcome, Dr. Kowino.
presentation. In presentation. Now, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I trust that you enjoyed um, the presentations which were made earlier on. And now, before you, is Dr. Coveno of the School of Education, Department of Education and Communication and Technology. I want to take you through uh, one important aspect of teaching or one important aspect of pedagogy and this is known as assessment i trust that even as you woke up from sleep you did not just come to my class without making certain preparations you spruced up yourself you look up i mean you look at the manner in which you are dressed and of course if you are use of makeups you also went and printed yourself before your mirror and confirmed that they were well applied. And therefore, assessment as such is a normal human activity. For those who read the Bible, you will come across the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, which says, 
after God had created everything, he looked at it, or I mean, he looked at them and certified them good. I believe that assessment the, um, forms part and parcel of normal human life or part and parcel of normal human behavior. We have to always judge the quality of our work. Just like in a wrestling match, before the wrestlers lock up, they will always try to size themselves. That aspect of um, activity or what we call sizing is some form of assessment so that they weigh their strength, whether um, they open, I mean, um, so that they may know uh, where to start from. And of course, by sizing yourself, you get to know what the likely strength of your opponent is. But then, um, what is the meaning of the term assessment? This is a systematic process used to determine the extent to which learning outcomes are being or have been achieved. It is normally done through measurement and evaluation. Measurement refers to a point or refers to a practice of assigning value or numerals to um, a learner performance. In majority of cases, measurement is quantitative. On the other hand, we also have another term here, evaluation, where we have um, a new certain adjective to describe what, I mean, the quality of our work. The normal new terms like excellent, meaning higher scores, very good, good. At times we use the terms poor, or when we want to be polite to our learner, we can say that you have tried, but not quite, and therefore pull up. All these are aspects of assessment. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, what are the various types of assessment that we have, or that we always have to put in practice in order to determine whether our students are achieving um, what is meant for them, or whether our teaching is on course. Basically, we have uh, two types of assessment, and these are formative assessment, and also what we call um, summative assessment. When teaching is in, uh, I mean, is on progress, we have to uh, make some reflections on what we are teaching. We have to ask ourselves, whether our learners are mastering what we are teaching them and therefore we engage in what is called formative assessment that is to say while teaching and learning is in progress where uh, we normally ask all our uh, oral questions we give class tasks assessment tests and even end of term examinations normally formative assessment is used to identify students needs in order to guide them towards desired goals. In other words, it is used to provide the teacher with useful information about the strengths or weaknesses of the students within an instructional context. But we also check whether we are, I mean, our pedagogical practices are uh, in the right direction that is desired in order for us to achieve what we call um, the learning outcomes. We also have what we call formative, I mean, summative evaluation, or I mean summative assessment. In summative assessment, we sum up all our evaluative or judgmental activities. And this deals with summing up processes of learning at the end of the course. And it is primarily concerned with um, purposes, progress, and outcomes of the teaching learning process. We normally uh, use summative assessment to determine the effectiveness and the worth of our programs. We also use it to predict uh, the general trend in the teaching learning process and also to identify problems that might hinder the achievement of the set um, learning outcomes. We also use it for certification. Remember, I said that even formative assessment 
serves certain purposes. And a few of the purposes that formative assessment um, serves is one to determine whether learning is in progress. Apart from that, it tells us whether our teaching is on course. And of course, it enables us to collect data that we can use in um, um, reviewing the manner in which we teach or the various um, teaching learning resources that we need to make use of. We may ask ourselves, how do we assess or which tools do we need um, for assessment? Now, there is what we call direct assessment and indirect assessment. Indirect assessment, we use, uh, for example, in the area uh, of medical science, we can use projects, we can use uh, paper presentations or thesis, we can use case studies, we can use exhibits, and apart from that, we can also use what we call a clinical evaluation, as well as individual, uh, individual portfolios where we look at individual performance of various uh, students um, uh, in the, uh, that are pursuing a career in medical science. Now, apart from that, we also may use what we call um, test of knowledge or the cognitive approaches that we need in, um, um, uh, in determining whether our students are achieving or not. Written examinations play a very important role. You remember also in the area of medicine, we can use what we call multi-source 360 degrees review. Here we involve, I mean, we involve members of the faculty. We can also use peer assessment of um, what uh, the learners are doing. We may also involve allied health workers, for example, nurses and others. It is a teamwork kind of assessment. Now we also have objective structured clinical examinations. That is another important tool for assessing the achievement of our learners. And of course, at times we use it even in, uh, in uh, assessing um, uh, 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 the professionalism that is involved in the area of medical science. We may also use patient assessment, I mean, patient assessments, where we give the questionnaires to evaluate our performance as a medics, either in the course of our studies or even uh, when we are through with our studies and we are either on internship or we have been posted to various health institutions to discharge our duties. We may also have what we call simulations where we have actors. Some students may be acting as patients while their colleagues act as physicians or medics who are, um, um, uh, I mean, um, um, taking charge of them at the time that they are in hospitals. Now, apart from that, we can use uh, what we call critical incident reports for purposes of self-evaluation. And lastly, we may also use reviews of patients' complaints and uh, probably prof um, um, uh, professionalism lapses. All these are some of the tools that, for example, we can use in doing assessment in, uh, in the course of um, um, training um, our medics. Now, there are also what we call the general methods of, uh, of um, assessing our students. We can have testing, a part uh, where we use, uh, which is commonly used in our schools and faculties. And apart from that, we also have um, what we call um, general examinations. But then, as we construct tests, or as we prepare our students, I mean, as we prepare exams for our students, there are certain considerations that we need to put in place. For example, we need we need to define the learner's tasks as completely and clearly as possible, ensuring that the tests that we have will measure the intended objectives or outcomes. We must write the terms clearly. It serves no purpose coming up or constructing a test that has 
vague terms. Apart from that, we must also restrict the subject to matter uh, that is to be covered by the question that we are, present, we are to present to our learners. It serves no purpose. Far-fetching items that are not relevant to the examination or that in actual sense we never exposed our learner to during the course of instruction. Uh, now, besides that, we also have to check the adequacy of the questions by seeing whether, uh, um, I mean, um, other experts agree with what we have done, and we must ensure that our tests measure the, uh, the intended objectives. Now, there are measures of a good test, or what we call characteristics of a good test. A good test should be valid. That is to say, for example, it should measure the intended skill for which, I mean, that it is supposed to measure. Apart from that, it should uh, be reliable. That is to say, consistency in scores. If the test is given uh, to a similar cohort, or a similar group of students pursuing medicine, for example, that test should yield the same result. Now, we also have to consider what is called, um, I mean, what is called <coughs> objectivity. Thus, the freedom from uh, subjectivity in terms of judgment the test must be as free as possible from bias. Added to that, the test is supposed to be um, discriminative, putting um, each and every learner in his or her right place. And lastly, and lastly, we look at the test in terms of its usability. That is economy in terms of time, Economy in terms of um, what we call um, resources that are used in administering that particular exam. Now, we have various types of tests. A test can be objective, and the objective tests are also of um, different types. We have the matching type. We have the multiple choice types. We also have the supply types. They allow objective tests have their um, weaknesses as well as their strengths, as listed uh, uh, here in the slide, which soon I will um, post to you in your various um, uh, emails or maybe websites so that you can go through them at your own pace. Now, Whenever we are constructing tests, we must bear in mind what we call um, the taxonomies of educational objectives. In instruction, these taxonomies enable us you know, um, to be as comprehensive as possible, and uh, it is what enables us to give our tests the good characteristics that I mentioned earlier on, that is objectivity, usability, reliability, and so on. And therefore, I take you now to what is called um, um, the table of specifications, where we have to look at how our tests should be constructed with recourse to what we call um, the taxonomies of educational objectives.
Now, in uh, the table of specification, we have to look at the various levels of learning that should guide our testing. For example, in Bloom's taxonomy, we have three um, levels of objectives. We have what we call the cognitive level objectives, the psychomotor as well as the affective domain objectives. Under the cognitive domain objectives, we have the following six levels. levels. Knowledge, which involves recall of specifics and universal or recognition of facts, terminologies, dates, persons, or general uh, practices, for example, in the area of medicine. For example, skills that are required in um, uh, diagnosing a problem or a disease that a, um, a patient could be having. We also have comprehension, which measures understanding, application of knowledge, analysis, synthesis, evaluation, and the creative level you know, of learning. Now, whenever we want to, uh, whenever we uh, want to construct a test, all these levels within this uh, taxonomy must be put into consideration. Now, let us look at what we call the table of specification. Yeah, there we are. Good. This is how a table of um, specification looks like. I gave the example of the subject of history, but now we can look at it from, I mean, uh, from either the natural sciences perspective or from the um, medical, um, what we call um, a medical class perspective. We have, for example, introduction you can, uh, to history, but here you can give an example of introduction to human anatomy. Now, under the various levels, for example, knowledge, you can have one question. You may ask a learner, for example, to define, uh, what, um, to define human anatomy. And there we also have what we call scores. It can be one mark. But first of all, we have there the number of items where we have one knowledge item. Comprehension, if you uh, look at it, we can, uh, for example, by passive. Then application, we may have one item. We may also have items that requires analysis, for example, issues, I mean, ethical issues in the area of medicine, synthesis, and then we have evaluation and we can award scores there, depending on the number of questions that we gave. Now, we can use that table to enable us to place our test items within the various levels uh, of knowledge that we are, I mean, in which we are testing the learner. The table will advance with the course content Remember, in the teaching learning process, we always begin from the simple um, items 
to the very complex ones. The simple items refer to those that may appear to be automatic, the very obvious ones, because we begin with the learner from what he or she knows as we move to what in Latin is referred to as terra incognita, that is, the lands unknown. Otherwise, assessment under normal circumstances is the gist of sound pedagogy. Why am I saying so? Whenever we are teaching, we teach at three levels. There is what we call the preactive level of teaching, where we put in place or we prepare for teaching. We may also uh, alternatively refer to it as the pre-operational level. Just like before, maybe um, you um, sit down to deal with a patient, you require a room. In that particular room, you must ask yourself, what do maybe um, uh, the heartbeat rate using a stethoscope and such kind of items. Now, for you to set up such a space or such a room, evaluate, I mean, assessment is very necessary. Currently, you must ask yourself, if infection with the COVID-19, you must think of the kind of protective gear that you need. That is an aspect of assessment, but this is done at what is called reactive level. Later, you engage the patient now in what is called interactive level. You ask the patient, where is your, uh, I mean, what is your name? Where do you come from? The aspect of epidemiology, you know, uh, then you may ask the learner, you know, I'm mean, sorry, you may ask the patient, um, for example, um, when did you start feeling this kind of thing? For how long? And the like, that is now at the uh, interactive level. And then maybe you can give your prescription, you know, take this. You may even as well um, prescribe some exercises and so on. All these uh, I mean, um, activities operate within what we call the preactive, interactive, and reflective levels of assessment. Otherwise, I trust that you will uh, enjoy our uh, you enjoyed our lesson. It is short though, but you can always interrupt more by you con um, either calling me directly on number zero seven two four six seven seven. 173, or you can always get more information from uh, me by you uh, contacting, contacting me through my email for josh at gmail.com or just walk to the Department of Educational Communication Technology and Curriculum Studies and you will always find me so that we engage more in this particular exercise. Thank you. A good um, Assignment, especially in pedagogy, is always uh, like what we call a lady's bathing costume. Number one, it is beautiful. Number two, it is attractive. And number three, it covers only the very vital parts of the body. I trust that my lecture has covered the very vital parts of what you may need in as far as knowledge of assessment is concerned. Bye-bye and God bless you. Thank you very much. Good morning. So we, we are here to make a, a presentation on how to we can able to include a learner with the special needs in an e-learning mode of facilitation. And the presenters, we are two, Dr. Joel Octoy and Dr. Josephine Shachakaduma.
So who are the best learners with, with special needs? Learners with special needs are, do, are those with a learning difficulty or a disability that makes them unable to learn in a normal way and therefore require a customized instruction to enable them to realize their learning and developmental potentials. Let us list some of the examples of, of those learners with special needs. One, we, we, we have those learners who have difficulties with hearing, whom we call learners with hearing impairment. Number two, we have learners with difficulties to see, we call them learners with visual impairment. Then we have learners with physical and health impairment, learners with intellectual disability. The others have difficulties to, to learn, we, we, we call them learners with the learning difficulties learning disability. Then we have, we have some learners with emotional and behavior disorders, learners who are gifted and talented, learners with autistic spectrum with disorders, learners with deaf blindness, among others. However, for the purpose of e-learning, we shall be able to focus more on two groups of, of learners. We shall focus on the, the category of learners with special needs in this mode, we shall look at learners with visual impairment and learners with hearing, so never, learners with hearing impairment. This is because the, 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 these two groups of learners, they experience difficulties with the learning tasks that demand the use of vision and to hear. Hence, the need for appropriate adaptations during the facilitation process for them on the e-learning. Then we have, well, the, 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 the main thing we should do for these crucial learners, we have to adapt at the way we present our content. Key is to adapt where we shall involve use of assistive devices for learners with visual and hearing impairments. In addition to the provision of late services, from the relevant people who may be necessary as you teach. And for learners with visual impairment, the key adaptation will be in terms of speaking more, or you have to, you have to verbalize more, you must voice more. And the key, uh, and the key adaptation for learners with hearing impairment, they, they, they may not be able to hear normally, and the key adaptation is in terms of how do we talk, how do we communicate with these learners. <laughs> they may not speak, some they may not hear. You must adapt the skills as you communicate to them. Next. We, let us move to how do we make online learning accessible for the deaf stroke hard of hearing learners? Deaf stroke hard of hearing students are those with inability or limited ability to receive auditory information which adversely affects a child's educational performance in your class. What these deaf students have a hearing loss that is greater than 70 decibels. And the amplification of speech range of 125 to 4,500 circles per, per second may not help them at all, meaning they cannot learn as you speak, meaning we must present that content in another mode for them to learn well. Therefore, face-to-face -face communication for this type of learners shifts from audio oral, where it involves hearing and speech, and we move towards the visual educational mode, where we expect the learner to see, observe, and sign. For example, we shall involve the use of Kenyan sign learning sign or the language, which is, which is key for the day. In a virtual learning platform like the, like the e-learning, the deaf students who are, uh, are bilingual, meaning they can use KSL and written spoken language like the written English, they can read the content online just like the hearing learners in your class. How do we enhance accessibility? Next. How do we enhance 
accessibility to e-learning for presentation for, for our learners who are deaf, stroke, hard of hearing. We have various ways in which we, we can ensure as, as, the, as the lecturers who teach the deaf learners, they access the e-learning platform with ease. Number one, we use captions. In the captioning, it's the process of where we could do convert the audio content of a television broadcast, webcast, film, video, CD, live event, or another another production into text, and we we do we do display the text on the screen, on the screen or on the monitor. Normally, this this happens on the TV sessions where the, the presenter is presenting. And there is some captioning that is running down the presenter. For them to, for these learners to be well, but benefit well in the in the presentation that is audio in nature, the sound is changed into text, which is then displayed to the students as the activity is on. For example, as you are teaching, as you speak, as you teach, we should have captioning down there on the screen. Number two, we can use the, the, the we can do virtual learning process. Virtual learning, for example, we can use Zoom, which is very common nowadays, the webinar and Google Meets, etc. When the online presentation is through virtual media and and the, 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 and the lecture is in spoken language, the deaf student will depend on on Kenyan. Sign language in the preparator, which is this a very important person as you teach the deaf. You may need him to change what you are speaking in voice into sign. And the interpreter is highlighted or focused on to amplify the visual equity of the what you are speaking into KSL. The, 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 the speaker, in this case, who is the, the, the teacher or the lecturer, you must maintain eye contact with those learners. Very important. When you are teaching all those learners, whether hearing or deaf, it is important you maintain eye contact with the, the learner. Why? See, the, this is very important because it will allow our deaf students, they can be able to read your lips as you speak. They can read your visual the visual expressions and the language, which is very important. So you must maintain eye contact. Number three way in which we can enhance accessibility to e-learning, you can use assistive devices like the hearing aids. We can use assistive devices next. We, we, we can use the assistive devices like the next. We can use the assistive devices like the hearing aids, which will amplify the speech for those who are hard of hearing. Number three, number four, we can also use online uh, content. We can use online content as we teach these learners in hearing environment. The, stu the students with hearing environment, they can benefit much if the, if the content is sent to them in advance. If the if the content is sent to them in advance, and this will enable them to familiarize with themselves with what is to be taught, and this the, 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 the this will make them to, to read such materials just like the other normal stop hearing. Yes. So it's important before you, you go out for, for any lecture that you ensure you have to avail notes for the deaf student in advance. Very important, very, very important. Next. Also, next you can also the, the, teach, the, the, the speaker or those lecturers, as you teach any of the, of the classes with learners with their impairment, you must, you should pace the way you speak. You should not speak very fast or very slow. Why? This will allow the sign language interpreters to target what you are trying to speak so that they can change into sign language for the deaf child. Very important. And then when the, 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 when, the, the when, when a deaf student may be asked a, a question in the class or seeks a, a information, 
youth. The focus should, it should be on the student who is deaf while listening to the interpreter interpreting the spoken language. The lecturer or speaker should address such student directly, not indirectly. When you are when you are speaking to the deaf, you do, you don't ask the question through the deaf. You address the, the deaf student using his or her name, and also the, in the same way, the, the sign language in the, in the, in the interpreters should not be saying he or she is saying like this. But it, if it is if that happens, that question the, the qualification of the interpreter, the the, the, the deaf student and the interpreter are two roles in one and be not it is very important as you teach the, 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 the deaf one to ensure we have visual cues we have visual cues like pictures visual aids that we ensure the learner is actively able to, to participate in the classroom through the, the, the discussion program on the e-learning platform that the child must participate through the e-learning platform on the discussion forum. As, as the lecturer also, you must use total communication approach, where you use any mode of communication to make sure the child is able to learn like any other. Otherwise, I'm saying thank you very much. I want to welcome the next presenter, Dr. Joseph Oshetaduma, to continue. So thank you. So if you are going to reach us anytime, you, you can reach me on 0726 And Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for this session. Um, I will welcome all of you to this lecture. And I want specifically to discuss um, the content referring to learners with vision impairments and um, the devices they, that are used to enhance learning. First of all, let us define who are these learners with visual impairments. These are learners who are unable or limited, who have limited ability to receive information, vision, so much that it adversely interferes with learning. It is therefore an impairment in vision that even with the correction, um, it, it affects the child's educational performance. <clears throat> Learners with vision impairments are categorized into three groups. One, those with no vision. Um, these are learners who need, who need who, who use optical aids for reading and writing. Um, they may not necessarily uh, read or write using braille. Then the second group are those who are functionally blind. They have some function vision, but can but read using um, read and write using braille. And then there are those who are totally blind. Um, they have no vision and they entirely rely on tactual and auditory signs for their learning and even in the movement in the, in, the, in the environment. They use Braille for reading and writing specifically. Ways of enhancing accessibility to students with visual impairment to e-learning. Um, it's very important for us to take note that we have already three categories of learners with visual impairment. And that the while we shall be working with them, we must take note of every, each one, each one of them, the evidence of learning and even the materials they use in learning. So, for example, we are going to use various devices and materials, and some of them will be for those who have low vision, and others will be for those who are totally blind. And somehow, somewhere in the middle, there, there could be some who can use low vision and use those, use those for totally uh, blind uh, learners. So, um, first, before I even uh, discuss about the, the learning material, I think it's very important to note that all the materials used for learners with the vision impairment must be, but the, the learners must be familiarized with them. That if a, a learner is totally blind and you are introducing 
uh, a device or some material, they must be familiarized with the material first before they use the material. Very, very important because then most learners will not be able to use the material um, that they're not familiar with the, the way it operates. And not only that, we have some learners who are not just having this visual problem, they also have something in addition, like uh, some difficulties in, in, in coordination, some difficulties, some physical difficulties, etc. So that has to be taken into account as you access um, the, the materials to, for them to use. Um, assisting devices, students with division and disability may require special tools to access information online. They include one, CCTV. It's a magnification system um, that is used by learners who are blind or have low vision, and it magnifies images on the screen. And as I have said, the learner needs to be familiar with this, uh, um, uh, this device so that they know how to operate it. Because the, 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 the ways um, it has been designed is the way that you can mag magnify to make the an image big or small. And um, as we shall see, there are some learners who prefer large images and the others who prefer small images and others who prefer colored and others who, the others who don't prefer any color. And there are some who have just one color in their lifetime. And then we have screen readers and the JOS program and, and visual desktop access. Uh, that are used, these are software that allow individuals with visual disabilities to read the text on the computer screen through a braille display or a speech synthesizer. You can see it, is, it, it, it can change into print or into braille. And this is something that you need to really uh, train a learner um, to operate. Otherwise, they will not be able to, um, to use it. Then we have braille in Bosa and to convert print to braille or vice versa. Um, it is very important when uh, you are giving notes. And here we have the screen magnifier, um, specifically designed for learners who have low vision. And then make the notes. Okay. Um, you may modify or you may make them small. There's something you can use very small letters. Very big letters. You can see very big images and that of very big images. So it's just an assessment to know um, find out which one the learner may be able to, to comfort them with. Then it's now a modification. You know, um, a learner who is usually in bed has lost the sense of, of, of vision and then the learner depends on the domain of sense. For example, hearing, uh, touch. Um, smell, taste. Um, it, it is very, very important that um, um, if, if he's using some material, some, some devices, that are adapted in a way that the, the, the learner is able um, to hear what, what, what is in the content. And, and, uh, that, um, and that it's also very important for the learner to be assessed, to find out the hearing level. Because we could be having a learner who having hearing problems and not be able to use the sound amplifier very well. Then we have got online contents. This can be sent in advance to students to give them an adequate time to familiarize themselves with what is learned. Um, this also depends um, on the learners. As I've said, we have got the low vision and the total blind. So if you are sending content online, uh, you should be thinking of what, which content are you sending. Are you sending those for the low vision or those for the totally blind? Then tactile learning. Um, um, learners with vision impairment learn through touch. Um, the main um, avenue of learning for those who are learning. Um, learning this was a, such, 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 as much as possible should be allowed for tactile exploration. And as I've said in a good program, uh, this kind of um, uh, program should begin very early so that they are they're, they're trained and they are sensitive to their, um, their their touch system so they can be able to read by, by touch. It's not just assumed that you can touch and read. It's a system of doing that. Um, the use of readers and, and note-takers assist learners with the vision impairment with reading and note-taking. A number of learners 
the whole, in, 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 in the programs where they were learners with division payment, some of them have readers who read for them uh, texts and they, they, they write in print. Um, and, and, and it's very important that um, um, you, 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 you familiarize yourself with the, the system so that uh, um, there, are, uh, there, there are advised uh, when and how to do it. Because, of course, they cannot do that in the classroom. Then um, we have a tape recorders, a very important element of, uh, um, um, of a device that is used by learners with the vision payment. They record their notes, they can read the, 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 the letters when they have left the class. They can actually uh, even record the exams, they can record um, conversations, and then, then after class, they can be able to, um, uh, to, to, to revise or go through uh, what has been learned in the course of the day. Thank you very much um, uh, as, of, for this time, and I think it makes things for them to be trained thoroughly in the use of these devices. Well, thank you so much. Now we can have a time of question and answer. I saw Grace had asked a question. So the experts are here and they'll be able to pick questions and answer with the, in line with the presentations that have been made. So if you have a question, just unmute your microphone, and then you can ask the questions and then the experts will be at hand to answer. So uh, Grace, we can start with the question that you had asked. Chat in the Reku, I think in the for you chat, but you can you can unmute and ask the question. Huh? Okay, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'd uh, wanted to clarify, are we supposed to have learning outcomes for our courses? Yeah, like there we have MCS 604, 602, and then now uh, I mean learning outcomes and objectives for every I mean, the course generally, and then now we come down to all the topics and also have learning outcomes for that, or how are we supposed to go about it? Okay, so let me welcome Dr. Rabari to answer that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, in my presentation, I gave a learning outcome for program and uh, for courses. I even went down to the topic. Yes, ideally, that's the thing. But uh, when you are developing now our programs or courses, uh, I think we need to follow the format that has been prescribed and given to us by the CUE, okay? Where they have, I think they have goals for the program, they have purpose, for the course, and then learning outcomes for the course. Okay, so these others are just to assist you to be finer. To, I mean, to make your instruction or lecture more effective, you need to also focus. Even that lecture you are giving, what are the outcomes that you target at the end? It would be better. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe, uh, maybe Grace, I can, I can put a rejoinder to what Dr. Rabari has said. If you looked at our course framework, the one that we shared, you have to put learning outcomes for each topic. So you're going to have the, the course learning outcomes. And then at the end of each topic, uh, at each topic, you'll also have to define the learning outcomes for each topic. That is what Dr. Rabari is referring to. When he's talking about the lecture, the lesson, the topic, you also need to define the learning outcomes at that level. Okay. So Thank any you. other questions, please? No, uh, allow me to ask, uh, well, it's not really a question, but an observation. Yes, Dr. Omoto. Uh, this is Dr. Omoto. Now, the way our medical courses are, you will, you would notice now among the faculty members that in the year one and year two, we have a lot of, uh, in the Bloom taxonomy, uh, classify as recall and understanding uh, levels in year one and year two, particularly in human anatomy, the basic sciences, and year three becomes uh, somehow an interface 
an interface where now you are moving. We seem to be moving from recall understanding and applying some of the knowledge to now understand disease <coughs> and some part of year four. But now coming from year four, things we learned from uh, year one, year two, year three, now we are seem to be applying and analyzing. It seems rising in hierarchy as students come from year one going towards year six. In the presentation, however, I did not see the uh, the, the recall standing, uh, particularly in evaluation lies. And yet, a lot of the questions we ask the students uh, involve part of that. And I saw so much conversation circulating around analysis, evaluation, and creativity for the PhD students. Uh, maybe was it Dr. Josh or Mogaka who was giving the, that uh, presentation? And Josh, uh, on a light note, you've, you've uh, I created quite a bit of conversation, uh, which is interesting among the public chat. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ferry. Normally, questions that deal with recall operate at the lower levels of knowledge and here we only examine the learner on what he or she knows and it advances with time in the recall questions there are certain terms which are very common or terms that i may i say we normally uh, make use of at that particular level that is why, I mean, I'm sorry, what, when, where, which, and who. If you look at the content of what you want to teach, in majority of cases, you will begin with what? For example, defining certain terms or the basic terms like in the area of medical studies or medical science. This level only forms the introductory part of what you are dealing with in um, pedagogical practice. But then it advances with the time within uh, the various levels of the taxonomies that uh, I highlighted on and that my um, friend, Dr. Rabari, also dealt with. We only want to uh, determine or we want to know what the learner has mastered at the basic level. And I say that uh, we always start from the very simple concepts as we advance towards the complex ones within the ladder of the cognitive domain objectives. Thank you. If you have more questions, please you are free to raise them. Hello? Thank you, Josh. Mm. You can learning and hearing devices. It depends on the needs of the language. For those who are profoundly deaf, they require some language interpretation. 
then those who are hard of hearing, they normally come with the hearing aids. But if they require one, it can always be provided. No. Optical you can move closer to the microphone. We can hardly hear. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Ma Madam. Oh, Madam? Madam. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Bernard Awonda. In Maseno, we do what we, we know, we do have various needs of our learners with special needs. For example, for, the, for, for, for those learners with hearing impairment, it, it, will, it will depend at the level. If the learner is profoundly deaf, meaning he cannot be able to benefit at all from speech, what you need is a sign language interpreter. And Maseno University has three sign language interpreters. And for the hard of hearing learners, we have those learners who can hear, but to a, to a small extent, very simple. You can, the learner should sit in front of the class as you teach, you face the learner, you maintain conduct. Or for those who can able to benefit from the hearing aid, which is also very available in the, in the shops, you can, they can be fitted with, with a suitable hearing aid after they have been assessed and they learn like other learners. And for the learners with visual impairment, we also have we have we have the various groups. For the learner with the with low vision, they can, we can able to enlarge the, the print, which is just you change the, the, the font from normal font 12 to 18 or to 12 or 24. And this will also depend with the type of here with the type of the visual loss. And for the learners with the total Visual, lo visual laws who are normally called the learners who are blind, we shall normally use the, 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 N, the NVDA, which is free online. You just download the NVDA and, you, uh, and we, we install in the laptop of the learner so that every, so that, uh, 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 so that uh, uh, every notes you, you will send the learner, it can, be, it can be changed from text to speech. And when you are teaching in the class, the learner can be able to, re able to record the, the notes. You are using the phone or any of the recorders which are also there. Mama Son has separate recorders. We can just give the learner, you are able to record the notes. Thank you. So maybe I rejoin that to what uh, Dr. Tari has uh, alluded to. I want to make this connection to our recording. Remember, we learned about how to create voice over PowerPoint in our previous uh, training, and we are going to repeat the same training in the third day. So now you see the value of multimedia, even in terms of supporting the learners with special needs. So those, of, those who are blind, so when, you, when they are able to listen to your voice over PowerPoint, you're taking care of their interests. Um, in, in, in response to the sign language. There might be some of the recordings you're going to make that you may need that sign language interpreter of Maseno University to be able to come. We will record them and we'll put their, them just next to your video. So as the learners are watching your video, we can have the, the sign language interpreter. We're going to embed them onto your video. So in, for those recordings that you feel you, and also if you have these special learners in your, in your class, Please come and let's have that discussion at the e-campus for your course. Then we can be able to make that those arrangements with the School of uh, Education, the Special Needs Department, and we'll be able to see how we can do the adaptation of your content to meet the needs of those special needs learners within your class. So all these have been taken and been factored into. So in case you, you have those learners in your class, come and we'll be able to see the adaptation techniques that we can put. Apart from that, on the learning management system, we have a feature for adaptation for the people who have uh, low vision. So the system can be able to enhance the text so that the learners are able to see it better. So don't worry about that, that you have already taken care of that in the learning management system. Okay, so we can pick more questions. Dr. Omoto had indicated that there was quite a storm that was created in the chat when <laughs> Dr. Kowino was presenting. Uh, okay, the chat is too long. So maybe the, those who posted can be able to unmute and, and ask the question so that the experts can be able to answer.
Okay, so Dr. Willie says, uh, thanks to COVID-19, we got a, a chance to go through pedagogy. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> that is good. Thank you so much, Dr. Willis. Um, my, uh, my, okay. Go ahead, Dr. Omoto. Yeah, just, just before this, uh, this thought is lost, you remember the last meeting we had, uh, we had said the face-to-face -face consultation would, would take place, was it Wednesday? Wednesday? Yes, yes, it would take place on Wednesday. It's on Wednesday. So I just want to clarify that uh, the secretary will be will be opening fifth floor, so the boardroom will be available on on Wednesdays in the morning. So the secretary will will be there for. So Barbara, I think you can uh, you can have access to the boardroom so that faculty members could come for consultation there. Was it between? Oh. Sorry, Doctor, we lost you. What was that? What was the recommended time? Eight to ten. I think that's the time we had suggested. Okay, so eight to ten. So for those who have those special considerations, we can meet there eight to ten. And uh, I will also share the phone numbers of the pedagogy experts so that more inquiries can be channeled to them and they'll be able to support. I think uh, the day has mentioned is. Um, not the correct one. Uh, I think the dates were 27. We can't hear. We cannot hear. We the, date, the date for face-to-face um, -face consultations, as I remember, was 27th of July, 10th of August, and 17th of August. Yeah, we can have several. We said we can have one, one, one day a week. That is okay with us. So we can spread it, but we... We can spread it across the weeks as you continue to develop your content. So, Dr. Koino wanted to respond. Dr. Muto, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, Dr. Koino. I have not seen you. Ask, you are asking about the video costume. <laughs> In a normal pedagogical situation, <laughs> the teacher is always advised not to make the presentation so dry. A little humor is necessary. <laughs> that is the juice or with which we garnish our presentations. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah. nice. Any more questions on assessment? Hello? Any more questions on assessment? So do we have any more questions? Or do we reserve the questions for the sessions, the face-to-face -face sessions and the personal one-on-one? -on -one? Okay, thank you, Bernard, for that question. I'll allow the Department of Social Needs can answer that. Sorry, Dr. Mokabi can answer that. Mokabi. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, you had asked a question on... Uh, whether the university can organize sign language lessons for staff who are interested. We are in the process of developing a certificate course that can cater for the needs of everyone who is interested in learning sign language. So soon you might enroll for the course. Thank you. The school offers um, postgraduate diploma in uh, Kenyan sign language, you're always welcome. Dr. Angel, um, hello, Doctor. is Dr. Angela with us? Yes, yes. Okay, so I think we're about to wrap up. Uh, this session with the pedagogy experts. I've yeah. recorded the 
session and I'll attach it so that mm. you missed out can benefit from whatever was discussed during the session. And then uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, we still have the one-on-one. -on -one. As Dr. Moto has uh, said, we're going to be at the School of Medicine boardroom. And if there's going to be any concerns that relate to pedagogy, I'll always, I'll always ensure that the right expert is, uh, the information is channeled to the expert so that the expert can support that individual as we are developing content. As of tomorrow, as of yesterday, I have enrolled most of you in the courses. I am yet to receive a location from two departments. I'll share the information on our WhatsApp so that those HODs can supply the information so that everyone starts developing their content. I hope by now you have access to the courses you're developing on the platform. Please confirm after this session, then we can always post uh, any questions regarding to the courses if you don't have any course on your dashboard. I'll be able to sort it out. Barbara, just confirm that we are still doing our online um, training session tomorrow and Thursday. Yes, yes, I confirm we are going to be doing our online training sessions tomorrow and Thursday. I didn't get you. Yes, we will. We will have our sessions tomorrow okay. and Thursday. And we'll focus on the learning management system on uploading content. And then we will revise the, the session on recording. Okay. Voice of Okay. So, Angela, are we free to leave? Yeah, please. Yeah, we are free to leave. Let me end the meeting now. <laughs>